Okay. What am I going to talk about? Uh, new paradigm for compact remote expeditionary research, uh, subtitled Rats in Paradise. Now let's see if this works. All right, what's the new paradigm? And uh, the, uh, the short story is, if you're desperate to get out, uh, it's a boat, it's a sailboat. That's the new paradigm. Traditional research requires ships. And until about 100 years ago, those were large sailing ships. And about 100 years ago, um, they were taken over by motor, stress, motor vessels. And so here's my characteristic uh, motor vessel research ship. Motor vessels replaced sail about 100 years ago, but they require onboard fuel. And this is a critical point because, very crudely, I'm going to characterize your average motor vessel in terms of its length, its breadth, and its draft. Now, there are some, and here comes the equation, so if, if, if this is bad, you know, close your eyes. Uh, length typically is about four to six times the beam of a boat. And there's a reason for this. I know many of your vehicles don't actually follow this rule, but there is a balance between hydrodynamic efficiency and um, what you can carry. And most boats, of course, are there to carry things. And it turns out that, obviously, if you want the maximum volume, you want a sphere. But that's not terribly stable, um, and it doesn't move through the water terribly well. Uh, the sphere, however, maximizes the volume for the surface area. If you want to find this balance, it turns out you need a length of a boat about four to six times uh, the beam for, for a vessel of this type. And also, the beam is related to uh, the draft. And the reason for that is that most motorboats have what's called form stability. And so if you've done any uh, naval architecture, you'll realize that a lot of the things, the stability which stops the thing from simply rolling over, is that as it rolls, the center of buoyancy moves across, and you get a writing moment. To get that writing moment, you need to have more beam than draft. And so there's a kind of, uh, somewhere between two and four, uh, between beam and draft. What this means is that the three fundamental uh, dimensions of a vessel like this are all related to length. So you can characterize the vessel by its length. Um, you must have seen this. It basically is a crude approximation for the drag, and it says that it's proportional to you know, some coefficient. There's always some twiddly coefficient out the front you have to calibrate for, um, times density of water, times the frontal area of an object that's moving through the water, uh, times v squared. Now, that frontal area, of course, if it's pointed, is, has a different coefficient, but still the principle is that the drag force at a given speed goes up as like b times d, which is actually like l squared. So if you're characterizing your vessel by l, uh, the power that you need to push the vessel through the water, it goes up uh, like l squared at a given, given speed. The capacity to store the fuel you need to drive the motor goes up as l cubed. And this is interesting because what it means is very small vessels basically cannot carry enough fuel to go very far. And if you want to go further, you have to make the vessel bigger. Eventually, as you make L bigger and bigger and bigger, L cubed has to win over L squared, and you will get the range that you want. And so there is some, there's a fundamental limitation. If you want to be able to reach remote places in the ocean, and ocean basins are thousands of kilometers across, then it turns out if you want to travel something like order of a thousand nautical miles without resupply, you need a vessel that has a length of maybe 50 meters or above. It also turns out that the cost of operating those kinds of vessels goes up as L cubed, and that will cost you about 10 to the 4 euros per day, roughly, rough speaking. That's a lot of money. So, for example, I've been looking at um, some remote expeditionary um, forces where we've been needed to go for a month. And to, to do that, you're going to need more than a quarter of a million euros. You've got to be a pretty good stand-up comic to get a quarter of a million euros. <laughs> so that is a goal which is very hard to reach. You have to do a lot of preparation because the moment you hit the ship, you need to be on it, because you cannot afford to waste a single minute of a single day at that kind of money. All right. 
Let's try again. There's another element to this. The motor vessels have been taking, have taken over from sail about 100 years ago. And until uh, probably 10, 20 years ago, uh, they were all we really had for remote uh, marine sensing. And this, was, um, this has had an enormous impact on our understanding of the oceans. Basically, it's, and I'm not allowed to say that's word. Um, they told me not to say, f f f well, um, OK. There's a thing called uh, Monk's um, paradox. No, um, Walter Monk said, you know, uh, he called it the century of undersampling. And what will happen if you sample too sparsely in space or time is you alias all the spatial structures and all the temporal structures. And there is a human trait that if you don't see something, you're likely to believe it's not there, even if you haven't looked. Who's read Pooh here? Any Pooh fans? Yeah, we've got a Pooh fan out there. Yeah, we've got a couple. No, that's just rubbing somebody's eye. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a Pooh goes to look for Piglet. And he knocks on the door, and there's no answer. And, um, but he figures, well, he doesn't know. Maybe Piglet's asleep, right? So he goes in, and uh, he can't, can't see Piglet. And so he starts searching around more and more. And the more he looks, the more Piglet isn't there. And that's the exact words that A. Milne used. And that's exactly right. You can only be sure that something is not there when you've looked sufficiently far and hard. And if you haven't looked, it's just unknown. It may or may not be there. So the oceanographers fell into this trap. And they concluded that 90% of the energy in the ocean systems was in the big conveyor belt currents that run around the, the basins. And maybe 10% was in the, the eddies and the swirls and the, the small energy weather systems of the ocean. And it turns out it's the other way around. About 10% of the energy is in the main conveyor belt systems. And about 90% is all tied up in this oceanic weather at scales that were too small to be able to sample with our ships that cost too much per day because we have so few of them because we can't afford more. So now we can add in autonomous vessels. And if you drive an autonomous vessel uh, by a motor, you still have the same kind of constraints that we talked about for a motor vessel, but they're a bit weaker because you don't need bunks and, and a canteen and toilet facilities and a whole bunch of stuff that humans need. Um, and you can run the thing 24-7 with more space for fuel because you no longer have the space put aside for crew. Uh, but there are still some constraints. And here is an example of um, actually quite a successful uh, autonomous um, surface vessel uh, built in the US. It's quite large because it still needs to operate for extended periods and it still needs to carry a lot of fuel and a lot of heavy equipment. If you drive your vehicle by wind or solar or wave, in other words, if you have some kind of regenerative energy capacity so you don't have to carry the fuel, then you can make it very compact. And now you can bring the price down to maybe two orders of magnitude, maybe 100 euros a day of operating cost, not talking about what it costs to build it. And um, a wonderful example of that is um, this autonomous surf uh, surface vehicle you see here, which has a rigid sail. And this vehicle, as you'll see shortly, um, is able to go into any weather you like. So here's another um, misconception. People believed until about 50 years ago that small vessels were not seaworthy for full ocean weather conditions. That small vessels would be dangerous and would sink or break up if you put them into the worst weather. And because you can only forecast a few days ahead, at least that's getting better, um, you shouldn't be taking voyages that take more than a few days because otherwise you cannot guarantee that your vessel will be spared from the worst weather. Now, this is plainly bizarre. I mean, I can just do a kind of mental experiment. If I take one of those bottles that I sometimes drink out of and I, I cork it securely after it's empty, I can throw it into the sea and it can go through any kind of weather you like. And it will probably wash up somewhere on somebody's beach. Small vessels do not have to be unseaworthy. In fact, small is often easier to make robust enough 
with an exoskeleton in order to survive very severe G-forces. Now, I'm not saying it would be a pleasant ride if you were miniaturized like Alex and were inside that bottle. Uh, it might not be very comfortable, but you'd probably survive. And indeed, these small autonomous vehicles do exactly that in the very worst of weathers. So why is this only happening now? Well, because there's a whole bunch of technologies which have been coming up over the last 20 or 30 years which have combined to make this possible. It was theoretically uh, possible, say, 50 years ago, and um, people had visions of the oceans filled with little drones doing our oceanographic work, but it was not technically possible until quite recently because of the kind of technology advances, all of which, the ones I'm putting up here, have contributed to making this a reality. And many of these technologies, if not all of them, uh, nearly all of them, are um, evident in your vehicles. Now, I said these small surface uh, vehicles were able to withstand the worst possible conditions. And I want now to just draw your attention to the difference between taking something to sea, which eventually you may well end up doing, and operating in a pool environment. And uh, here is some footage taken a couple of days ago uh, from one of these uh, sail drone explorers that I just showed you in, in the picture. It's taken from the middle of um, a Category 4 hurricane, Hurricane Fiona, which is currently raging, um, September 22nd. And the sail drone that was deliberately sent into the middle of this hurricane in order to sample wind speeds, sea surface temperatures, to get data which allow better predictions of where that hurricane is going and how it's going to develop. You need in situ data, and you cannot see uh, through the cloud cover with a satellite very easily. And so they sent this thing um, into the hurricane, and amazingly, they got some footage back. Maybe I can start it here. Yeah. So. This is what the sea looks like in a 100 miles an hour wind um, in a Category 4 hurricane. And if you're in an, uh, an eight meter boat, this is the kind of experience that you can expect. So if you haven't seen seas like that, uh, if you go to sea to do experiments, uh, sooner or later you may well come across uh, something of that nature, hopefully not in an eight meter vessel, but it's a demonstration that uh, even a small vessel like that with a rigid wing survives even that kind of weather. That's available online, of course. Um, all right, so now we have motor vessels at one end, 10 to the four euros a day. We have AUVs at the other, 10 to 2 euros a day. They can do very different things. I would not want to be on a research vessel of any size in a Category 4 hurricane. But I can send a sail drone in and sit in my comfy office and watch this video feed. So ASVs and AUVs can do wonderful things that you cannot possibly do any other way. And it's a great compliment. But there's a big gap in the middle. So that's where we come in here, part three. And I would like to suggest we could add crude sailing vessels as an intermediate niche filler. They are also enabled by many of the things that have enabled AUVs and ASVs. Small sailing boats, like very small AUVs, suffered until fairly recently um, from the problem that you couldn't carry a useful payload and you didn't have the electronics, uh, navigation systems, and so on, uh, that you really needed in order to make them work for you as a research platform. That's all now changing for the same reasons that AUVs can be really useful, even though they are very small, because they have driven low-power electronics, miniaturized sensors, and on and on and on, and battery technologies. All of this is also playing into the possibilities for small sailboats. Um, there are a few extra ones. Uh, for example, reverse osmosis desalination. Uh, you might not think of that as being a great enabler, 
But it, of course, if you're going to set out in a small sailboat and you have a crew of five or six people, um, you're going to need some water. And if you're going to be out for a month, you're going to need a lot of it. Um, now, how much? Well, okay. At a pinch, on my boat, we used to get through maybe six, seven, eight liters of fresh water a day per person. That's, that's doable. You know, you don't dehydrate on that. You can, you can have the occasional shower. You can cook. You have to do your washing in, in salt water, but okay. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, the average American uses 200 liters of fresh water a day. But they're not normal, of course. So somewhere in between, you know, 10 and 100 is a reasonable number. I would say 20 is ample for a boat. But even 20 liters, that's over 100 liters a day for like a crew of five. And that means you're going to need three tons of water in a month. And most small vessels are not going to be able to carry that. So you need reverse osmosis desalination. This used to take a lot of power. The way people used to desalinate water was to boil it and then condense the fresh water, right? Distillation. That takes a lot of energy. Then they had reverse osmosis filters. Still takes a lot of energy. Now there are technologies which recover most of the energy in the compressed fluid to help the pump in the next cycle, and they are about four to five times as efficient. And now you can get um, the cost of a reverse osmosis um, piece of kit for a vessel of this size, the energetic cost way down. And uh, you can finally run a boat um, with four or five people on board almost indefinitely um, with the device like this, which is um, one of the more modern. Um, this one's uh, we fitted just about a year ago. And you can see it has um, carbon fiber vessels on the bottom, which contain the reverse osmosis filters. It has a carbon fiber tube on the top, which is the energy recovery system. Um, and this device, which is relatively compact, it's probably only about this long, about this tall, about this wide, um, draws about 19 amps and produces 50 liters of water an hour. So uh, run that for a couple of hours every day and you're good. Okay, so what's the catch? Well, um, first of all, you need a small team. If you need a lot of computers and technicians um, and a team of more than about five or six people, then you're going to run out of space on a small sailboat. Um, they have to get by without any big heavy equipment, so if you're going to try and tow a two-kilometer array that weighs 50 tons, that's not going to work. Uh, and as you can imagine, having seen the storm images or the video from the uh, sail drone, uh, personnel have to be comfortable on a small vessel uh, in close quarters. Even if the sea is flat, the boat is rather small, smaller than most people are used to coping with for their personal space, and uh, some people find that a challenge. And you need a very capable crew. Uh, you can't afford more than two or three because otherwise there's no room for the expeditionary crew, and they have to do a number of jobs. Uh, first of all, they have to actually sail, um, they have to navigate so that you get to where you think you're going to go. Um, you're going to need a sailmaker um, to repair the tears and stuff that happens when these things wear out. You're going to need a rigger to adjust and repair the uh, standing rigging when that, uh, that starts to go flat. Uh, you need an electrical engineer because, of course, the boat has uh, its electrical systems and they all need maintaining, um, especially if you've been eaten by rats. Uh, you need a mechanical engineer, obviously. Um, and a, a plumber or a hydraulic engineer, because you've got you know, water systems on board too, both fresh and salt. Um, you need a, a diesel mechanic, because when the wind doesn't blow, we do actually have an engine and some diesel fuel, um, and it's, uh, it's quite important to be able to fire that up if, uh, if there's no wind at all, as you can see in the photograph on the right, where this is uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, close to uh, the tropical convergence zone near the equator, where it can get very flat and oily. Uh, you need a carpenter, generally, uh, at least on our boat, there's quite a lot of wood, uh, fiberglass, uh, so you can always put that and put fiberglass uh, skills in there. A fisherman, because uh, much of the protein that we eat comes from the sea, 
we rarely ever open any kind of processed food, so almost everything we eat is, is fish and uh, maybe a bit of frozen meat and, and some, some pasta and some rice and what greens we can carry with us. Uh, you do need somebody to cook all of that, of course, and food is very important on a boat. Um, the cook is, in some ways, the most important person there because if people aren't eating well, then they're not happy, and after that, everything starts going down the tubes, which brings me, of course, to the final requirement that you need a, you need a barman and somebody who can make a mean gin and tonic. <laughs> so what does this boat look like? Um, Last time I was out in, uh, in June, I went up to the top of the mast uh, to change a light bulb. Uh, how many sailors does it take to change a light bulb? Um, two. One to winch you up the mast with a safety line, and the other to uh, plug in the bulb. And so this is a, uh, uh, about a 17.5 meter mast, so it offers a nice view down on the boat. Um, top left picture, you can see um, the forward part of the boat, and you might be able to make out a couple of kayaks tied on deck. They are very important ancillary pieces of equipment for the boat. Um, and the, the forestay with its wrapped uh, sail. Um, the, low, the picture below shows you kind of the aft view of the deck. And uh, you see um, four of our solar panels there, uh, two of which you see in more detail in the top right. Um, and then uh, a close up of the foredeck on the bottom right where you see two, those two kayaks one orange and one kind of stealth navy gray and white camouflage. So we cater for all parties. You, know, you may have noticed that all, um, all autonomous vehicles out there that are on sale are either kind of orange or yellow for the, com for the commercial public market or they're versions of gray for the, for the military. So we have one kayak in each set of, set of colors. OK, um, what's all this about rats? I'm going to talk about three expeditions which exemplify uh, using a vessel like this to go and do some science. And the first expedition uh, was looking for rats, searching for rats in paradise. Uh, you'll see why I say it's in paradise in a moment. So you should, I hope, recognize uh, this, this piece of the globe. There's uh, India very prominently shown there, a Malaysian peninsula. We started off basically in Singapore. Um, uh, went up to Langkawi, across to the Maldives, and then down to Chagos. So the expeditionary part of the trip is from the Maldives, which is in that uh, right-angled turn you see on the, on the, towards the left, southwest of Sri Lanka, uh, down to Chagos and back. That's about 1,000 kilometers each way. What were we doing there? Well, I was taking down a marine archaeology team. Um, and their idea was that in ancient times, before ships had rigs that could sail upwind, sailors may well have discovered that you can sail all the way around the Indian Ocean, only sailing downwind all the time, by using the change in the monsoons. And if that was the case, almost certainly a number of them will have wrecked on the Chagos Archipelago, which is at the end of this line in the middle of the Indian Ocean because it's very shallow, uh, it's hard to see from a distance, and of course, they wouldn't have known about it. Those ships would have long since disappeared, they would have been wood, and the uh, shallows extend over 100,000 square kilometers. So where do you look for them? Uh, you could go out with a magnetometer, because they did use iron anchors, um, even back in Roman times. But where would you start towing your magnetometer? Because the scale over which you can search with a magnetometer doesn't really allow you to do 100,000 square kilometers in a, in a short while. So their idea was, well, you know what? Rats were not indigenous to these islands. So if we go and get some rat samples, we can DNA sequence them, and then we can find out where their ancestors came from, because they will have been the rats that left the sinking ship right at the outset. So that's what we went to do. We also took environmental DNA sample from water samples. Um, there was a nature paper 2019 which showed that where rats had got on an island, they had chased away the birds, and this impacted not only the ecological health and diversity of the land, but also the sea. And it happened, it works because uh, the, the marine system needs the nutrients in the guano from the birds on the land. And so it turns out where, even though rats are not uh, aquatic, 
if rats get onto an island, the fish population and diversity is adversely impacted. And they took eDNA samples from the water from 12 different sites, some around islands which had rats and some without. And from the eDNA, you can see what the diversity looks like, and that's what they were able to show. These samples were almost 10 years old. We went back and resampled 11 out of those 12 sites. So when those are sequenced, we should be able to uh, write the paper, which is the 10 years after version. Hopefully, we'll be able to see the same kind of pattern and reinforce the findings. And we will also hopefully be able to see how some of those island DNA patterns have changed over the last 10 years. Um, when I asked how long I had to talk, and I said, well, based on what I know, I need about five minutes. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was given an hour. So um, those of you who need to take a pee break now might be a good time. All right. For those of you who belong to the OES, um, you will have been given access to a beacon, uh, which is the newsletter from IEEE OES, uh, in which there was an article. And if you're interested in that, uh, it should still be available online. Um, and the article talks about messing about in boats in, in Chagos. And it covers this first expedition. Uh, the expedition was multinational. Uh, it was the first expedition um, that was not British uh, PI based to get a permit from the Indian Ocean Territories admin. Uh, you have to get a permit to go to Chagos. Nobody lives there. There is no infrastructure. Um, the uh, administration is very concerned about what happens if you get appendicitis or a toothache or whatever, because you're a 1,000 kilometers from anywhere. And um, so you have to provide all kinds of insurances and guarantees, and you have to show that um, you are um, capable uh, of carrying out significant scientific research to get this permit approved. And this was the first multinational permit uh, not run out of the UK to, to get that approval. Uh, here is Bridget Buxton, our marine archaeologist, who's preparing a whole set of uh, rat DNA samples for uh, sequencing. Uh, this is uh, myself and Caroline. Uh, we are preparing here samples for the eDNA, um, for the sites that we managed to sample around these islands. And uh, I think this is, if you can make it out, uh, the white line gives you the path. This is reported by Iridium. One of the nice little things we have about uh, the technology is that on the boat we now have an Iridium Go, uh, which allows us to make calls, send emails, uh, get weather forecasts. Um, and just as a byproduct, it uh, puts a page up for us where you can go and find out where our vessel, Jakara, is at any time, and the white line traces our history. Um, this turned out to be more than of passing value because when we got back to the Maldives, they wanted to see my clearance paper for the last court, port of call, which was, of course, the Maldives because there's no infrastructure in the Chagos. And so they said, well, how do we know you ever left? Right? You could have got your clearance papers and then just not gone and then... And then now you come back to me a month later and say, you've come back. You could have been here all the time. And um, so the agents, who are very entrepreneurial, um, pulled out their laptops and uh, dialed up the web page and showed them that, uh, no, we had actually been down to Chagos and back. And um, so now you know about the rats. Um, and you're probably wondering why I call it rats in paradise. And that's because Chagos is, is one of these awful places it's, it's full of uh, turquoise waters and shallow coral reefs and, and abundant fish life because it's a marine preserved area and there's no fishing. And, and, and of course, more coconuts than you can you know, avoid. If they drop on your head, they'll kill you. Uh, and, and lots of birds. And it's, it's just all like this. And we have to go in there with our dinghy um, and, and work in this. This, you know, this is my office for a month when we're down there doing expedition. Uh, this is us actually looking for a, a nice place to take an uh, eDNA sample. And uh, these, this atoll group is in the middle of the Indian Ocean in a protected marine area with no fishing, no habitation, no diving, no anthropogenic impact to speak of. And as a result, it's the home to about a million nesting birds. Uh, it's the biggest uh, bird sanctuary in uh, this part of the world. And uh, these birds have no idea what humans are. 
So they behave completely differently. You can, you can walk right up to them, and they just kind of look at you and go, oh, that's interesting. I've never seen one of those before. That's a booby, by the way. OK. Um, and this is our home for a month whilst we're out on the islands. And it has everything you need in a home. In fact, my family lived on this boat for several years. So you see here, um, from, taken from the foredeck, um, late in the evening, nice uh, placid anchorage, and you see our two kayaks there. Um, the kayaks, as I said, are a really important uh, part of our kit because you have these shallow coral reefs and it will rip the bottom out of any other kind of boat that you try, or if you try and swim over there, you could get easily strafed up um, because it can get very shallow, and of course the coral's very sharp. The great thing about an unsinkable plastic kayak is even if it touches bottom, it's just going to scrape the plastic a little bit and you're, you're good, good to go, and it only draws about 10 centimeters of water, so you can get in even at quite low tide over the, uh, the coral fringe, and you can load it up with all the gear that you need to take ashore. Um, we also did take uh, magnetometers. This one is a handheld magnetometer, um, so we could go detail areas that we'd found uh, deposits, uh, metallic deposits in. Um, meanwhile, um, you know, there are no keys and there are no marinas, and so you just haul your dinghy up on the beach, and um, then when you find a nice spot, uh, you open up your, your, your case and your tough book, and um, it's easy to document. It used to be that you had to have some you know, notebook with a pencil and it would get wet and the, thing, the paper would disintegrate and it would be a nightmare. Now you just photograph everything with a smartphone and of course it's, it's already got all the metadata about um, time of day and GPS position and all this great stuff. So everything gets documented so much more easily. And this is me um, preparing the peristaltic pump that we use to take our eDNA samples. And um, this is what our little flotilla looks like. So we have the, the big boat, the 18-meter uh, Jokara, uh, from which we can launch um, the dinghy, which we can drive either with a small outboard or um, a petrol outboard four-stroke or an electric outboard. And then we have um, our dinghies, which we can use either to get ashore over the reef or we can use them to tow instruments. So here's an example of a proton magnetometer, which is now much smaller than previous generations, and it's intended to be towed at some constant depth. Um, very shallow reefs, that's very hard to do unless you keep your speed very steady. Uh, it turns out it works just great if you strap it to the bottom of a plastic kayak, um, and then you put the tough book and the battery um, in your dinghy, um, and then tow the thing behind you um, about 20, 25 meters behind the, the, the dinghy, and now you've got the magnetometer separated from all sources of metal because it's on a plastic kayak. Uh, it's at constant depth, about 20 centimeters below the, uh, the sea surface. It doesn't matter if you stop or go or what speed you tow at, um, and you can run the whole thing from the rib because it's now compact enough to be able to do that. And in fact, the first time out with this, with this kit, um, these guys stumbled across a wreck. And I should mention that there's also the largest arthropod in the world lives on these islands. Uh, it's called a coconut crab. Uh, it comes in um, several different colors. Um, these guys, when you stretch them out, sometimes I, my arms aren't long enough to be able to fully stretch them out. Um, I shouldn't be really stretching them out, but you know what I mean. And sometimes they come blue. And uh, one of the research questions I'm really interested in discovering is whether the blue ones taste any different from the red ones. But, but they are endangered species, so we're not allowed to, um, to eat them. But I'm told that they're absolutely delicious. And uh, so uh, the arthropods are indigenous. Um, uh, these guys are not. And so uh, this is our um, Bridget, our intrepid uh, explorer and um, hunter with the morning's catch of rats from, from an island. All right, I want to move on to expedition two. Uh, just to show you a little bit of variation. Um, this was about the ecology of the fauna and the flora in these islands. 
And here are our ecologists. Um, the guy on the right does um, fauna, and the guy on the left does flora. And the idea was to understand the rat ecology on islands where they want to eradicate the rats. So the move is to uh, take out the non-indigenous species and try and rewild these islands so that they get back to the um, genetic diversity that uh, they should have. So to do that, you need to map the indigenous and the invasive flora and fauna species to uh, plan that rewilding. And that's what they were, they were there to do. And this involved loading some rat bait. Um, sorry, sorry about this. Um, this. This could be a bit distressing to people who, who are friendly with rats. Most of the, I assure you, most of the rat bait was non-toxic. The whole idea was you lay down rat bait and then you watch how fast it's taken up because you need to know something about the population size and when they feed and how much is being scavenged by the coconut crabs who are not harmed because um, they have a completely different physiology. And so you have to load about 400 kilos of rat bait. The boat can take 400 kilos, not a problem. Uh, the problem was some of it was toxic just because you have to do the control. Um, and the ecologists hadn't reckoned on the difficulties of importing toxic materials into the Maldives. And so they hit a little bit of a uh, resistance. Um, the route by which they chose to fill out the paperwork only ended in a dead end. And the only official way to legally cope with this was to re-export it to Sri Lanka and do all their paperwork, and then re-import it to the Maldives doing the paperwork right so that we could get it on board as ship stores as opposed to importing it into the Maldives. And um, one of the things you may come across at some point is that there are times when you need a certain agility and a flexibility in the system in order to get something done. And uh, I, my guiding rule is to do no harm. I'm not that worried about harming regulations. I'm just worried about getting the job done and not doing any harm to uh, man or people. So the solution to this turned out to be, uh, let me, how do I put this um, delicately, um, persuading some customs officers uh, to do us a favor. <laughs> and loading the said bait uh, in the middle of the night covertly from a tender that came alongside um, and um, surreptitiously, and you can see the guys hurrying as much. Maldivians don't normally move this quickly. Um, getting, getting 300 to 400 kilos of bait on board the boat in the middle of the night so we could then sail first light the next morning and nobody would be the wiser. Um, so there are times when going to sea and doing experiments requires going that extra mile. Um, we had our own mascot. <laughs> this, is, um, this is Crabbers, uh, overseeing the whole uh, operation. And he's there also to remind me, that underneath you see the um, electrical control panel for the boat. The boat has both um, AC and DC, so it has uh, instrument quality AC inverter, pure sine wave inverter. Um, for a couple of kilowatts. It also has DC and of course it has um, a generator and alternator on the engine and solar panels. So there's quite a complex um, electrical system which was completely redesigned a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is, this is a, now our distribution panel. Um, what's it like actually being at sea on a boat like this? Um, let me see whether this works from here. Yeah, it does. It's mostly like this. So it doesn't have to be 100 miles an hour Category 4 storm. And this is where the Iridium comes in and a service called Predict Wind. Um, full ocean atmosphere models have now improved so much that uh, you can get quite accurate wind um, predictions anywhere on the planet out to maybe five days. And 
that allows us to plan much more effectively and safely about where we're going and when, so that hopefully we never uh, hit uh, serious nasty weather. So this is just uh, some regular sailing, um, pretty much full sail up. Um, you can see we've got a kind of gantry on the, on the boom. This allows us to drop the main rapidly without it being all over the deck. It's all part of being able to handle a boat with a small crew, essentially only two people. And when she's sailing along like this, uh, inside the cockpit, um, it's really very pleasant. Uh, so it doesn't have to be violent at all. Um, you know, you've got a moderate heel on, but uh, she's quite stable, um, quite smooth. And uh, you see here um, on the right-hand side of the cockpit entrance uh, to the galleyway, uh, our instrument set. And this is an absolute godsend. Uh, the blue screen is, of course, a, a color chart plotter, which has the latest digital charts. It has GPS. It has a 24-mile Doppler radar, which is overlaid. Um, so we can see squalls. We can see um, it, it's actually most useful now for uh, tracking small weather systems like squalls so that we can avoid getting too beaten up um, by those as they come through. And the Doppler tells us something about how strong the squall activity is, so we know how much sail to reduce by. Um, so that kind of technology, the 24-mile um, color radar with Doppler, is, is something that's only been around for the last five or six years for, for sailboats. Incredibly valuable. We also have a transmit and receive AIS which is a great help for um, collision avoidance and eases the uh, night watches a great deal. Uh, we have a, an autopilot, which does the steering 99% of the time and is worth at least eight, three crew because I don't know anybody, um, well, I do actually, but very few people who can, who can helm for more than two four-hour sets uh, in a day. And so that means you can run the boat with essentially only two crew, providing all this stuff works. Okay, so back to Chagos um, on the second expedition, this time for the ecology. Um, and I just need to remind you, it is, of course, a horrible place to, to, to spend, your, spend your time, so that's why I keep going back. Um, and uh, here's uh, one of our ecologists uh, interacting with a local uh, member of the population. And uh, a different uh, member of the population, this is a, a turn. Um, so they were looking at bird populations and uh, what kinds of trees and also uh, the rats. Okay, enough about Expedition 2. I want to move on uh, in the last 10 minutes or so to uh, the third, which is in planning and which I'm very excited about. Uh, Expedition 3 is to see whether we can find a new species of pygmy blue whale. And uh, you may well know that uh, something like 96% of all the large whales on the planet were eradicated in the whaling years until the 70s or 80s, more or less. Um, they, many of those species are now rebounding. Some, of course, are not, and they're not going to make it. Um, those that are rebounding are showing interesting, lots of interesting stuff coming up, one of which is there are probably many more species of whale than we knew existed. And now some of them are becoming numerous enough that uh, we're starting to notice them. And there is a huge concern now with the anthropogenic noise and ship strike impact on marine mammals, which is only going to get worse as the number of those whales increase. Um, why do we think there could be a new species? Well, because for 17 years, the CTBTO, which is the organization responsible for uh, monitoring the Earth for nuclear testing, and who has hydrophones buried in the sea all over the planet, have been recording a particular stereotypical call. And uh, if you know what a spectrogram is, that's what I'm showing here. And at the top left of this diagram, you see a kind of comb of tones. So it's, it's several different tones. They're not harmonics. Um, and they last for a few seconds. And then there's a bit of a downsweep, and then there's a very low 20 hertz unit. So this is a very characteristic sound time, time frequency structure. It's not heard anywhere else on the planet. None of the other whales that we know of have this signature. And this whale has never been seen. 
or at least if it's been seen, people who saw it didn't know that it had this. So we need to find out um, what these whales are, what kind of whales they are, and hopefully get an idea of how many there are and whether we need to be concerned about them for um, responsible ocean management. So here on the right is a uh, record from 2002 to 2019, 17 years, uh, from the CTBTO hydrophones. And there are two colors uh, shown in here. The little, um, these sort of histograms, if you like, are daily detections. So there are many times of the year, or sometimes of the year in many years, um, where you can see maybe a thousand or more detections of this stereotypical call at a hydrophone in a day. There are a lot of them. The blue represents the detection histograms for a, a hydrophone which is to the west and south of the Chagos Archipelago. The black is from a hydrophone which is very near an island called Diego Garcia, which is where the US have a big military base. Uh, they basically use it as an unsinkable aircraft carrier. So if we have a lot of uh, a potentially endangered species that only just been discovered, whales, uh, around an unsinkable aircraft carrier, uh, which also has a bunch of Navy ships coming in and out with very loud sonars, uh, that's something which I think we need to know about. So from this sort of scatter plot histogram on the right, you'll see that the, the black blobs, okay, they're pretty, mm, not terribly evenly distributed. Uh, they seem to be around sort of August, September, October, maybe into November. Uh, general trends is that uh, there seem to be more and they extend back as far as June uh, in the later years. Uh, this is consistent with there being more and more whales uh, showing up. The blue, um, don't worry about the fact there's no blue after 2014 because the hydrophone stopped working. Uh, so that's why there's no data after 2014. Um, up to 2014, the suggestion is that in December and perhaps in January, you stand a reasonable chance of seeing them. Um, they're seen probably not every year, um, but in the latter years for which the hydrophones were working, they were mostly around in December and um, at least half the time in the latter years around in January. So we think December, January would be a good time to look in the area that's covered by the Western hydrophone. And um, that's where it starts getting interesting because uh, here's a map of uh, the Great Chagos Bank, which is the big shallow area in um, British Indian Ocean Territory. And uh, you may be able to work, uh, just see there's um, an HA08S down in the bottom uh, right-hand side of that bank, which is right by the Diego Garcia base. Um, that's the one which I showed you the black uh, detections from. The other one is HA08N for north, even though it's in the west, um, or northwest, uh, which is to the west of the Great Chagos Bank. And now you understand that these two hydrophones are separated by a lot of shallow water, and so signals received at one would not be received at the other. And if you do like a, a, a 2N um, parabolic equation run for all kinds of angles, uh, you get a very nice pattern, which I'm not going to show you, uh, which shows that basically the Diego Garcia hydrophone is only sensitive looking to the east, and the, um, the other one, north, uh, is only effective looking uh, from northeast to southwest, more or less. And so we might expect that these whales are somewhere um, within about 80 kilometers, the modeling suggests, given a guess for what their source level might be and what the noise level looks like. You might see these animals within about 80 kilometers of uh, that north hydrophone. But just because that's where you know you can see them with this hydrophone doesn't mean that's where you should look. Because like poo, you need to look at the places that you haven't looked before if you want to know whether they're there or not. And that's where the phytoplankton comes in. Chlorophyll can be inferred indirectly from a nonlinear uh, filter applied to hyperspectral satellite images. And so you can get a map of chlorophyll production. 
Here is a map, uh, an average annual map of um, chlorophyll concentration around Diego Garcia. And you see that chlorophyll blooms occur essentially on the, on the bank um, and on the, they correlate very well to the shallow areas that are shown in white uh, on the map on the left. Um, and mostly on the northwestern side rather than the southeastern side of the bank. And this is because the prevailing wind is from the southeast. And these, this uh, chlorophyll tends to be advected with, with the weather. And we know from uh, various studies in, in and around the Azores and in, uh, by Embari in the canyon that there is this uh, wonderful link. When you get a chlorophyll bloom, if it's combined with an offshore wind that wafts the bloom out to sea and also moves the surface waters out to sea, that causes upwelling along the coast. That upwelling brings cooler, uh, nutrient-rich water. And that combination, two or three days after a chlorophyll bloom, can create a copper pod bloom. And so what you're looking at is a chain of larger and larger animals building from that original chlorophyll boom, bloom. And what happens with the copper pods is that the whales show up about three or four days after that, and they come vacuum, the baleen whales, which filter copper pods, they come vacuum that stuff up and feed. And if that's what's going on here, and it seems to be the most likely uh, explanation, then we should be looking kind of along a band to the west of where we see the chlorophyll concentrations are being generated in this season. And that would be consistent with where we hear these animals at this uh, northwestern hydrophone. And so the proposal is to search in that kind of light blue area, more or less, from uh, Peros Banos, which is um, a group, that little group that you see at the top of the picture in the middle, um, down as far as um, Egmont, or latitude of Egmont, which is about where the um, hydrophone is. So the hydrophone is shown as a DGN star in the, towards the bottom of that ellipse. And my guess is that our chances of finding these animals are most, the greatest uh, in that region in November, December, which is when we get the best steady southeast winds. It's also when we get the calmest weather, so it's the easiest to deploy our hydrophones. And the idea is that we will go with hydrophones, um, either self-recording uh, uh, units, which we can send down on a Kevlar line that basically you can put on a fishing reel, um, or, and or a hydrophone on a long cable so we get real-time data. Um, we may use uh, something like a blue ROV uh, to take instruments down to depth. Um, and so the next question is, well, OK, um, what do you do if you actually find them? Suppose you, that's not what I wanted. Um, suppose you uh, put your hydrophones in and you hear faint signals. OK, then you know they're probably uh, 50, 60, 80 kilometers away. And um, that's not going to help you very much because you're not going to find those very easily. Uh, but what if you, what if you put your hydrophone in and you heard a really loud signal, what would you do? Cover your ears, okay. Any other suggestions? Look for them, how? Okay, so the first thing is to send up the drones. So we have a couple of drones, like a, a Mavic. Uh, they can now fly for 45 minutes. They can get out to 10, 15 kilometers. And that's not bad. If we think we can detect them out to about 80, then if we get a weak signal, we know they're like 50 to 80 maybe. If we get a really strong signal, there's a good chance they may well be within 10, 15 kilometers. So if we can go out with drones and find out where they are, the hydrophones tell, them tell us they're around somewhere within a reasonable range. The drones might actually locate them. What do we do then? Count them. Count them. OK. So. Um, Basically, uh, you're after photographing them because, yes, then you can start counting them. You can see how big this pod is. If you get the drone up maybe uh, 100 meters or so, uh, you should be able to see on a good clear day 
in open ocean clear water uh, down, say, five meters. And then you'll be able to catch all those whales that are sleeping near the surface or which may not actually be at the surface breathing, but they're in the process of, of doing those breathe dive cycles. And you should be able to see the whole whale. And given that you have control over uh, the zoom on the camera and you have the altitude of the drone, then you can use photogrammetry to work out how big they are. And if you know how big they are, that's already a huge clue, along with the shape, about what kind of species whales uh, they could be. So that would be brilliant. So um, what else can you do? Confirm with eDNA. Confirm with eDNA. OK. So uh, you can basically motor or um, sail. And sample, sale of ochre, not quite ochre, no. Let's not have ochre, let's have over. So there's a number of ways that we could try getting DNA. One is, uh, if you're in the vicinity, um, hang a bit of flypaper off the bottom of your drone and see if you can fly.